of the USS Cole DDG-67 on October 12, 2000, when the ship was attacked and bombed by Al-Qaeda terrorists during a refueling stop in the Yemeni port of Aden, or Aden, however you pronounce it, killing 17 United States sailors. Lippold assumed command of the coal on June 25, 1999, and served until he was relieved on March 9, 2001. Lippold is a 1981 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He received a Master's of Science in Systems Engineering, parentheses, Joint Command, Control, and Communications, close parentheses, from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. He graduated from the United States Army's Command and General Staff College in 1994 and from Fort excuse me, Joint Forces Staff College in 2001. Before serving as commanding officer of the USS Cole, he served as the operations officer, or the executive officer on USS Shiloh, CG-67. He also served as the operations officer and the commissioning crew of the USS Arleigh Burke, DDG-51, the lead ship of the same destroyer class as the USS Cole. Following his departure from the coal, he received a series of desk positions at the Pentagon working in the War and Terrorism Division of Joint Chiefs of Staff, Directed for Strategic Planning and Policy. Lippold was instrumental in the creation of a detainee policy in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 attacks. He retired as a commander in May 2007 at the age of 47 during a ceremony at the United States Naval Memorial in Washington, D.C. Lippold is a senior military fellow with Military Families United, an advocacy group opposed to the release of prisoners held in Guantanamo. On February 4, 2010, the Las Vegas Review Journal reported that Lippold was considering a run for U.S. Senate in Nevada against Harry Reid. We lost that one, I guess. Commander Lippold. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Mike, but I'd also like to take a moment and thank Artie and Gary, because there's the one I've been associated with for several years now to come out here, and I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to address each and every one of you. But I need to thank you, because while I may have been blessed with the great crew on the morning of October 12, 2000, when we were attacked, I also know that we could not have done what we did that morning without the thoughts, the support, and the prayers of you Americans back here at home who sustained not only us, but our families as well. So on behalf of my crew, but those young men and women that are at the tip of the spear today defending our freedom, thank you for coming out today. Thank you for what you do. Keep up the great support. We would not be a free nation without each and every one of you. I had the privilege of standing on USS Cole and saying the three greatest words of a naval officer's career. I relieve you. With those three simple words, I carried out a centuries-old time-honored tradition where I assumed total accountability and responsibility for a $1 billion national asset and the lives of almost 300 of our nation's sailors. One year later, we deployed from our home port of Norfolk, Virginia. We went into the Mediterranean for about two months, and then it was time to go to the Middle East. We went alongside of an oiler and topped off our fuel and then raced across the eastern Mediterranean, down the Red Sea, rounded the corner, and at about 2 o'clock in the morning I was off this little port called Aden, Yemen. We had gone from a navy of 4,000 ships following World War II to a navy that morning of 315 ships and there was no oiler within 1,000 miles and we were ordered into that port to get fuel and we were below 50%. We pulled in, tied the ship up, arranged for three garbage barges to come out and two came out and were alongside getting trash and they left. I was sitting at my desk and we'd been refueling for about 45 minutes when there was a thunderous explosion. You could feel all 505 feet and 8,400 tons of guided missile destroyer quickly and violently thrust up into the right as we were plunged into darkness, ceiling tiles came out, the ship was twisting and flexing in this odd three-dimensional motion as we came back down in the water. Initially, everyone thought fuel explosion and didn't know what had happened. What we didn't know was there was no announcing system because of design flaws, it had failed. Because of other design flaws, no alarms worked, and in complete silence, I was blessed with a crew that fell back on their training, went out, and immediately started to save USS Cole from sinking. Within about an hour and a half, 
the ship was stayed and we knew we were going to survive and stay afloat. At the same time, a triage effort was going on. To tell you how remarkable my crew was, that first day we would evacuate 33 wounded off the ship. We did it in 99 minutes and of those 33, 32 sailors would survive. You can't ask for better than that. We almost lost the ship Saturday evening. We'd been hit on Thursday, but by Sunday evening, we were beginning to recover it, and by Monday morning, we were back. And then we began a difficult process. Never forget and never leave anyone behind. We knew, we knew that we had 12 sailors trapped in the wreckage of the mess line, the galley area, and down in main engine room number one. By that point in time, we'd had people coming out to help us. Federal Bureau of Investigation, Navy Criminal Investigative Service, Mobile Diving Salvage Unit 2. And within hours, we kicked off an effort Monday morning where we began to work tirelessly and constantly to get all of our sailors out of the wreckage. It may have been a long time, but they deserve to get home to their families. We would work for the next four days. One by one, we would recover them. And as we did so, we needed a way as a crew to say goodbye to each of them. They would come out, they would be identified, we would put them into body bags and then drape it with an American flag. The crew would be assembled back on the flight deck. And as each of those sailors would begin that departure from the ship, three sailors on each side would carry him toward the back. The crew would come to attention. And as they approached the crew, we would come to attention and render honors to them. They would go down the brow. I would not allow them to be taken ashore by a Yemeni boat. There were Marines there. USS Cole was named after a Marine Medal of Honor awardee from Iwo Jima, and we would load those sailors in the bottom of a Zodiac boat with Marine guards providing escort, where they would take them ashore and begin that journey. And one by one, day after day, it took us four more days, eight days total, we had recovered all 12 of our sailors off the wreckage. For me though, it comes back to the first day. When Navy ships are in port, we hold a ceremony called Colors. Every morning at eight o'clock, we play our national anthem. We raise it and fly it over the ship for the entire day. And then at sunset, calculated no matter where we are in the world, we lower that flag, fold it, and wait till the next morning. As we came up on the first day, the executive officer and I were standing at the back end of the flight deck where the flag staff was, and he looks at me and says, Captain, what do you want to do about colors today? Do you want to lower the flag like you normally do? Do we want to lower it to half-mast to honor those that have been killed and injured in the attack? And I will never forget looking at my XO, looking up at that flag all stained with the dirty black residue from the explosion. I looked on at the slights coming on in the twilight in Aden, Yemen, and I turned back to the XO and I said, XO, we're not going to lower this flag. This flag is going to fly under lights as a symbol of resolve that we are not going to let this terrorist attack deter us from our mission of defending freedom. That flag would fly full mast under lights getting up to it every morning for those eight days as we recovered our shipmates and they began that long journey home to their families. But on the ninth day, we held a memorial ceremony. Our chaplain who had been in the Mediterranean had flown out to us. He was on board and ministering to the crew. At sunset, the crew was seated on cots on the flight deck set up like benches. All the support people that I mentioned before, FBI, NCIS, they were all standing behind us as the chaplain got up and walked to a microphone just like this one. He gave the invocation. I spoke, and then a crew member from every rank that we'd lost spoke. Officer, chief petty officer, and enlisted. As a crew, we sang Amazing Grace. Chaplain gave the benediction, and at sunset we lowered that flag, our battle ensign, and folded it. We had 17 sailors lined up on the starboard side of the ship, and as we passed that flag from sailor to sailor, we would pause, render salute, ring the ship's bell twice, 
and announced the name of the shipmate that we'd lost. When it got to the end, that flag was turned over to me when I had my relief on USS Cole and he said those three great words, I relieve you, he rebuilt that ship, that flag is mounted on board and three weeks ago Monday, it deployed back out for the sixth time to defend our nation's freedoms on the high seas. Trust me, I'm keeping an eye on that flag because eventually that ship will finish serving our nation and our Navy. That flag's gonna come off it is coming to go into a museum. It's part of our naval heritage. It's part of our nation's history. Before 9-11, there was 10-12. And again, it is because each and every one of you here today that supported us during those dark hours when we thought we might lose the ship, but sustained us as we managed to recover each of those out of the wreckage. Never forget, always remember, and bring our people home. We did it, and our government still owes to do it. Thank you, and thank you for letting me share the story of my heroes today.